right, folks. So um, I have the pleasure of kind of kicking off our summit. So I will do my best, even though we're talking about a challenging topic today of depression, um, to make sure that you walk away feeling informed, empowered, maybe learn some new bits and pieces of information, but hopefully above all else, feel validated and supported. Um, I know throughout the summit days that there will be a lot of good insight, good support, a lot of warm folks, especially as we are in multiple different holiday seasons. So I know this can be an extra difficult time for folks. So I'm glad that we're all here together. Um, but I am used to ranting and raving and I only have 30 minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to try to pull myself in. Um, and if you hear any little meeping sounds, just know I have foster kittens in an enclosure in this room. <laughs> so <laughs> you're not hearing random things. I just, and I would love to show them off to you, but then that'll become the whole presentation. That's not what you came here for. So um, we will start with um, just kind of understanding depression a little bit more. Um, there's a lot I'm gonna try to get to you, so. I might be racing by fast. I believe everyone has access to the chat. So if there's any questions um, or just any comments, always feel free to share them. Um, so first, what is depression? I know that sounds very much like a, I'm about to give some goofy uh, presentation. <laughs> what is depression? Hmm, I wonder. Um, but a lot of times what I've noticed is it's important to differentiate it from other emotions. So I've worked with many folks who have felt like, oh yeah, you know, I've been really depressed and they meant something different. And we realized they meant something different. On the other hand, I've met people that are like, well, I'm just a little bored, I'm a little down. And it was actually depression. So I really like to work through some of the definitions and the nuances of things. Because depression is intense, uh, but what's hard about it is that it looks different for many people. For some people, depression is very visible to others. We've got somebody kind of hiding out in their room. They're not interested. They're not motivated. They're always trying, trying to sleep, um, resting, maybe not eating. Uh, then we've got people who can walk around and smile and put on a good show, show up to work, check all the boxes and feel just like that other person. Um, so there's so many different varieties of it. And those two examples are only just few of many. Oh. But besides depression, you know, there's some other words that I think are worth thinking about. And I'm not sharing this to invalidate anyone's experience of depression, but how sometimes how we label ourselves is how we live. You know, when I work with my clients, I always tell them, you know, we have to look at our language. If we're saying, you know, I'm just a bad person, I can't do anything. We are going to walk through the world as that. If we walk through the world saying, you know, I'm mad and resentful, we almost become those things. It's like we take on the characteristics of those emotions and we can lose sight of who we are instead of being a person that exists with those emotions, you know, without them, you know, kind of commanding what we do um, or feeling like the absolute truth. So I think some other words that are important to think about are things like sadness, grief, boredom, despair, confusion, disillusionment, disenchantment. Um, because many times we might be actually feeling one of these things. And you know, I work with a lot of folks that have something called alexithymia, which means I am not sure what emotions I'm feeling. I maybe have a very small vocabulary for it. It may just be bad, good, mad, sad. Okay, um, so I'm used to really getting into the nuances of emotions. Um, I'm going to share something here that might <laughs> have you raise your eyebrow because a lot of people are like, do you think I'm in kindergarten? No, <laughs> of course not. But um, I really enjoy the use of a feelings wheel. 
I know. But what I like about them is that they give us language. Language is everything. I have seen people, I mean, I think everything revolves around language. How we define ourselves, how we label our emotions, how we label others um, can kind of make or break friendships, how we feel about ourselves, how we're existing and treating ourselves. So I recommend those not always to, you know, uh, I got to use it all the time or I can't, or I don't know actually how I'm feeling, but to give you more language, you know, instead of, you know, I'm just depressed. There's something really wrong with me. Like, what is actually happening? Am I grieving something? Did I lose something? Uh, maybe I feel a really strong sense of anguish. I'm in very deep pain. Um, and that can be a part of, part of depression. Um, am I just bored? Am I just having a season of just maybe feeling feeling like what I'm doing is not not for me? Am I confused? Am I kind of fuzzy on on what my next steps are in life? Uh, maybe I'm disenchanted with things. you know the the sparkle has worn off and I don't know if I like this anymore. And why I encourage that is, so we have a little more clarity to see the path forward because when we just default to certain labels sometimes we tend to all it's validating but it can also be invalidating or we forget to maybe go further like what's going on recently you know if i am depressed where did this come from so i encourage an attitude of curiosity which is why i bring that up now, the causes of depression. Um, I know when I when I wrote my intro for this, my actually written intro, I put causes because there's a lot of kind of mixed up stuff around that. Um, so something I learned some time ago that really rocked my world a little bit, and I could tell how much it was glued into our society is because I, I didn't even want to reject it. And usually I'm very open and accommodating to new ideas, experience, research, um, is the neurotransmitter cause. So that can be empowering and also at times disempowering. Um, so when it comes to this, oh, we just have an imbalance. Um, that has actually been debunked. But <laughs> one of my favorite articles is, the neurotransmitter theory got debunked and psychiatry forgot to tell everyone. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, I highly recommend, although it can be a bit of a dry read, um, is Mind Fixers. It's a really interesting book about the whole history of psychiatry since the beginning for all different mental health conditions. So as much as there can be genetic causes, um, oftentimes this is through a line of perhaps some version of trauma. So when we think of, if we were to go back to depression being passed down, usually we're going to find something, something that changed the neurobiology of our family line. Maybe it was, you know, being displaced, you know, from a homeland. Maybe it was war, maybe it was death. A lot of loss, miscarriages, grief, pain. Um, and that is often what is passing down the family line. Um, and also, when we witness somebody who is, you know, depressed or anxious, we tend to internalize some things about ourselves. I talk about attachment a lot. Um, just in my life and in my sessions. And some people will say, eh, yeah, my, my family's pretty cool. And then I'll ask them a couple of questions and they're like, oh, and that's, not because, that's not because I'm trying to create dysfunction. Um, but I just know how the very minute things can impact children and growth. So I'll ask people, you know, when you're, you know, when you were young, did you witness a parent very withdrawn? You know, when they were dealing with stuff, did you see a lot of just like grimacing, discomfort? Um, 
you know, panic or just very blah baseline. Nothing would change or brighten the mood. You know, you'd give your parents flowers or a card you made at school and you just got, huh, oh, that's nice. Okay. You know, or something else. Even witnessing things like that can change how we develop and can then turn into what we see, you know, representing as depression and other mental health considerations is because when we tend to feel like nothing I do can impact somebody, you know, like I'm not seeing that I'm able to bring joy um, or ha have some sort of impact or have something land, you know, with my parent or guardian. We tend to internalize that maybe we're a burden or we're not enough. And now we may be dealing with depression. So a lot of times there's some environmental pieces that come up where we, maybe we witness that. Or maybe home life was was pretty darn good, but we go to school and kids are picking up on something, which I'm always very fascinated by this. <laughs> kids always seem to know that somebody's different before that person even knows. And it could be something from someone being neurodivergent to someone being in the LGBTQIA community or something else. They know, and they'll usually tell you, um, but more in more crass words, uh, what's going on with you. So sometimes home might be fine, but then we get somewhere and somebody's picking up on something and then we're othered and othered and othered. Um, we end up doing things like people pleasing or chameleoning, we're shifting who we are, and really it all ends up becoming a big performance. That is another thing that can often lead to depression. It's because when you don't trust your own insight, judgment, or intuition, and we're used to everyone else being the more powerful authority force, we just don't trust ourselves. So how, how can we like ourselves, celebrate ourselves, uh, feel motivated to take on the day, and it can start impacting everything, which is why most of the ways that we pick up on depression is things like appetite, sleep, attitude, concentration, and how we're evaluating ourselves. I've always found it very peculiar that out of all the symptoms that can you know, maybe a doctor can pick up on very medical weight loss or weight gain, the appetite, the sleep, the guilt in there. There's That's usually one of the um, ways to diagnose it is this, this kind of prolonged feeling of guilt or shame. You've done something wrong. You've disappointed somebody. You are something wrong. Um, and thinking about where that came from as well. Because what I notice is, to me, that I also work with a very niche population, depression almost doesn't mean too much because I feel like it comes par for the course with so many other things because it's that relationship with self. Um, you know, this is not research-based, but I'll always remember that in my family, there's this quote of, you know, depression is anger turned inwards towards oneself um, and how we end up kind of resenting or mistreating ourselves um, based on past experiences. Um, and I do see that depression lives alongside a lot of things, you know, which is why I said it's not that it doesn't mean much. I think, I think most people have seen me before now I didn't mean it like that, but that it often lives and is woven into things like PTSD, anxiety, OCD, um, any experience of trauma, um, you know, even in the psychosis conditions, the dissociative conditions, you'll see something like that there. And another thing that I've just kind of noticed, and this has been a newer realization for me, is society's impact. Part of my theory on why things are skyrocketing that a lot of people have also theorized as well um, is 
we have this experience nowadays of what I call witnessing powerlessly. We watch things happen in the world of varying degrees of pain. And we often don't feel like there's anything we can do. And in order to try to understand more and maybe feel a sense of control, we stay on top of the news cycle. And I'm certainly not encouraging to not be involved. I think that's a great show of solidarity and trying to stay witness um, to people that are going through pain. However, it's very different than what our brain was ever prepared to do. And I think that's important to acknowledge that back before virtual access, oftentimes we would have no idea. We wouldn't even know what's going on outside of our own town. But now we know about the strife of everyone, everywhere. Um, and as that's that can be, now that we deal with it, and nowadays can be important um, as a show of support, um, it's also difficult. And we want to make sure that we're not doom scrolling and that if we are involved in information that we're trying to find resources to share, you know, finding the resiliency in what we're witnessing and knowing that we can care about so much and that our care doesn't have to end, um, but we can choose how we're engaging with material because sometimes, you know, I've seen people just watch horrific video after horrific video after horrific video um, and then feel like there's nothing that they can do. So I think this witnessing powerlessly, as well as social media, as much as I love social media, it has also been a huge source of warmth and connection for so many, myself included, um, that we, it's almost like we know too much, if that makes sense. It's like our brain just knows and is aware of so much that it's hard to process. Um, and I almost get the sense that our mind is just caught in the loop of trying to catch up. Um, which can lead to a lot of just despair and overwhelming sadness, no matter who you are, to the very deeply empathetic and intuitive, um, to the very kind of neutral folks. That seeing things that we never really knew that we were going to see, um, you know, it does it does change things. It, it opens the world and it be, can become kind of that feedback loop. Um, so I'm a big fan of doing what we can with the resources that we have. So if you can share, share things, um, if you can give back to your, any community that is given to you in any way, always matter. This is also a great relief, oftentimes for people with depression. Because depression is, I always joke with my my friends, family, and my clients. I'm like, it's a bit self-centered, is it? Not like a crappy way. Um, for those of you who don't know me, you might be like, oh my God, this person. But <laughs> no, it's just, it's very... Like what the content that we deal with is very much like I'm bad, I'm doing something wrong, I'm broken, I'm damaged. It's very me, me, me. We're so lost in this world. And I've always enjoyed the quote that kind of goes along the lines of, you know, don't think less of yourself, but think of yourself less. Because when we're able to balance it all a little bit more. And I'm not encouraging to go to others and give, 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 give until you have nothing left or to ignore and validate or put yourself to the side because many times in living with depression, that's already happened or other people have done it. Um, but to show yourself that you have impact, to find a tangible way of like, yes, I am a change maker. I see that. There is worth and value, not just because I am a change maker, but it is great immediate feedback to see like things that I share, things that I do in this world do impact people. I am here and showing up 
um, I think is a really beautiful thing that can be a part of working and living with yourself um, and dealing with depression. Um, then there's no right pathway, but I know as somebody who lives with that um, due to some other you know, experiences that that was immeasurably um, a piece of the puzzle is feeling a part of the world because many times in the isolation we don't feel a part of anything we feel very disconnected it's very easy to be like everyone else deserves things except me everyone else deserves love and joy and validation not quite me though because we don't feel a part of that circle and isolation is a very strong feedback loop. Another thing that I might recommend is what I call just existing publicly. You know, I'm not going to be so ignorant and say, just go out there, make friends, and volunteer, and depression be gone. This is too complex of an issue. Is when we just exist out, we're doing what's called opposite action, which comes from dialectical behavior therapy, aka DBT. Um, where whatever emotion we're feeling, oftentimes, if we've come from a place of trauma, uh, we very likely need to do something closer to the opposite, like isolation. Isolation invites us to hide, maybe stew in guilt and shame. The opposite action is, I exist, I show up. Even if you are simply going, walking around the block, or taking yourself to the freaking Home Depot, this is something I do a lot. My spouse is like, hey, I'm going to the, the post office. Yay, can I come? Do I love the post office? Uh, is it going to rock my world? Is it going to cure my brain? No, but I get to exist in public. There's something about it. It's when I, I've, I explain friendship in concentric circles. You know, we have our inner circle. We have our close friends. We have our loved friends, we have our acquaintances, friendly strangers, general society. And I think there's something in making sure that we engage with friendly strangers sometimes, because sometimes we don't always have it in us to, you know, connect with those other circles, or maybe we don't even have access to those. Another thing is just trying to be kind to ourselves in this society. Um, we're in a very unique experience now. Where a lot of people, you know, what used to be fun money and discretionary income has to go to basic needs. Um, and that, how that impacts us, you know, I almost wonder what the levels of mental health would be sometimes. I'm not saying that this is exactly what causes it, I'm not doing one track mind here, um, if we all had our basic needs met. And we were able to make have a little bit more choice in when and how we engage in work, what type, in what community, um, you know, where we live, what we do. So I know I kind of went all over the place, but that's me. And that's me trying to cram things into 30 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, I hope this gave you something to think about. And if you feel like joy feels very far away, um, I invite you to set your intention for contentedness um, or maybe even peace, just that general okay. And practicing gratitude can be something to start that path. Um, and always framing gratitude as a current noticing instead of a I take what I have and I and I'm fine with it. Gratitude is not about be happy with what you have. Don't ask for more. Ask for more and be happy with what you have. That doesn't have to be that duality. So as we go into, well, we're kind of already in the holiday season, but as we dive further and further into it, um, I wish you all joy, contentedness, peace. I hope something I shared kind of piqued your interest, made you think about things differently. I'm always open to feedback now and in the future. So if you ever need to contact me, 
pineapple folks will find me. <laughs> and I am always open to answering questions very quickly. So, you know, if you're looking for any more information, um, you can let me know. But I will take my pause here and let everyone get ready for the next okay. presentation. <laughs> Thank you.